Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for, um, for our first grand rounds of this academic year. We have a fantastic lineup of guest speakers ready for, for this, whole, this whole year. So thank you for joining us this morning. All right, so the first talk of this year is, is about middle meningeal artery embolization for chronic subdural hematomas. You know, the, the uh, why do we do it, when do we do it, and how do we do it? So this is a topic that has been um, uh, a lot of, it has seen a lot of interest recently in, in the literature, and um, but there's a lot of misconception and misunderstanding. So uh, I thought it would be a good good talk to talk good topic to start the year off with. I have no disclosures regarding this uh, subject. So we'll start with the why. So why does it matter? Why do we do it? First of all, what is a subdural hematoma? Just for for the medical students uh, present, you know, a subdural hematoma is simply a blood collection between the dura and the uh, and the surface of the brain. It is. Uh, it is a traumatic disease most commonly. Uh, it can be spontaneous from use of anticoagulation or antiplatelets, and in some rare instances could be associated with a ruptured PCOM aneurysm. However, it is by far and large is ex accepted as a traumatic disease. Um, so how do you go from acute to chronic? It's simply, it's a fibrinolysis of the clot that leads to uh, uh, the clot to become liquefied and, and uh, with time it becomes, uh, you know, subacute and then chronic. Um, so why do we care about chronic subdural hematoma? It seems like a simple disease enough. However, if you look at the, at the, at the, uh, at the data, it tells a whole different story. The, the, um, uh, this uh, chronic subdural hematoma is the most com is most commonly seen in an older population. In fact, it's three times more likely to be seen in patients above age 80 and above. And that's related to multiple things. You know, medicine has gotten really good at treating chronic diseases. So patients are living longer. However, they're not living longer healthier necessarily. So these are patients who, you know, have uh, heart disease, strokes, uh, vascular disease. So they're on, on, on blood thinners, on antiplatelet anticoagulation. They have neuropathies, they have myelopathies, they have difficulty ambulating, they, they, they fall a lot. So there's a lot of traumatic uh, uh, incidents. And on top of it, they have a atrophy of their brain, which is a normal evolution of the brain, which leads to more stretching of the, of, of the, of the, of the bridging veins that are thought to be the, the starting, the inciting event of a, of a subdural hematoma. So all these factors, obviously, and we, uh, with, along with an aging population, um, it is expected by the year of 2030, uh, chronic subdural hematomas will be the most common neurosurgical diagnosis in adults at that time more common than any el anything else that we deal with. With the incidence of about 60,000 of new cases per year. This is not something uh, minor. Um, and so on top of it, we have, if you look at, 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 you know, when we talk about subdural hematoma, everybody thinks, oh, you know, it's a simple thing, you know, you drain it, let, let it be, watch it, it's fine. But, but again, the data tells a different story. The in-hospital morbidity and mortality of subdural hematoma is between two to 5%. This is, I'm talking about chronic subdural hematomas. 20% uh, of patients who are treated surgically end up having a poor clinical outcome with significant disability. This is not necessarily related to the to the uh, to the to the technique or to the surgery itself, but to the disease, you know, seizures, strokes, multiple things that can be associated with that. The preoperative mortality is as high as eleven percent. That number varies a bit in the literature, but you can see it up to eleven percent. The number that does not vary, that is, that is surprisingly constant in the literature, is that at about a year the mortality of patients who have chronic subdural hematoma is about 30%. And that's not, and that's not, again, that's not necessarily directly related to the subdural hematoma. So I think chronic subdural hematoma, our thought process has to evolve from, you know, being this small disease to a truly a significant sentinel health event in the same way that uh, a hip fracture is thought of, you know, that you don't necessarily die from it, but it portends a poor outcome or a, a, an, an increased risk of, of mortality and excess death. Um, in fact, there's a, a study that uh, was done on 209 patients with mean age of 80 um, with chronic subdural hematoma uh, uh, diagnosis. Their uh, life expectancy was 4.4 years. Compare that to the uh, life expectancy of an age-matched cohort based on actuarial 
uh, data is six years. That's significantly less. That's statistically significantly less. And um, it, there are other studies also that show that uh, essentially that uh, risk of excess death persists for up to 20 years after the diagnosis of chronic subdural hematoma. So again, this is not something to be taken very lightly. Our treatment options are right now most most commonly are you know drainage essentially surgical drainage or observation but surgical drainage is the most commonly done is could be through burr holes as you see on the left or any variation of that you know seps or whatnot and or a craniotomy if it's if it's you know there's a lot of septation membranes you know you the, the you don't think the burr hole is going to be sufficient enough there are other treatments that were tried including including um, steroids showed which showed in the end a, a worse outcome um and also there's obviously uh, we we tried stan as well questionable not great so the 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 recurrence rate of our of our best treatments is about 5 to 30% so if you take it all together you have an aging population you have an expected 60,000 uh, uh, new patients a year. You have a, a high mortality at a year and, a, and, and perioperative morbidity and mortality. And then you talk about a recurrence of 30%. Put it all together, you understand that we have a, a supposedly benign disease that we don't have a good handle on that has a very bad, that, that, that portends a very bad prognosis to our aging population, which puts a burden on the economy, on, on finance, on, on the, on the healthcare as well. So on families, everything. So that's where middle meningeal artery embolization came in. So it, and if you think about it, it doesn't make sense. This is a chronic, this is subdural hematoma. It's a traumatic disease. Why are we doing an embolization for traumatic disease? Something, something is missing here. And th there is a link that is missing. And because we know that uh, the presence of blood alone in the subdural space does not necessarily mean that you're going to develop a chronic subdural hematoma. In fact, studies in, in animal models show that blood alone in the subdural space does not lead to development of a chronic subdural hematoma. So what is missing here? What's missing is that more recently we've, we've come to, to understand that there's a the dural uh, border cell layer. The, it's the innermost layer of cells of, of the dura. An injury to that dural layer leads to leakage of CSF and blood into the subdural space. What that leads to is to a, an activation of inflammatory pathways, including cytokines and interleukins, which then leads to release of angiogenic factors, including VEGF and fibroblastic factors, which then leads to neovascularization and formation of immature capillaries that tend to leak. As they leak, they, they, they activate, again, the inflammatory cascade, which then leads to angiogenic factors. So we are stuck in a, in a vicious cycle. And that leads to formation of membranes, and, and it becomes the, the, that persistent inflammation and a persistent leakage it, it, it outpaces the physiologic capacity to, uh, to uh, absorb that subdural. And that's what, that what, that's what leads to formation of the chronic and subdural and its, and its expansion. Where does middle meningeal artery uh, uh, come in? Essentially, the middle meningeal artery is uh, the blood supply to the dura. So the, that neovascularization, those new capillaries are coming off of the middle meningeal artery. So the goal is to essentially this is this is kind of the new thinking of of about about uh, chronic subdural hematomas. You have an injury to the dural uh, layer, then you have the CSF and blood that enter the subdural space. That leads to the accumulation. What we used to do is just this: the surgical drainage. This cycle persisted. We didn't have any, any way to, to, uh, to address it. Now we actually have a way to address it. So now from there's the inflammation, the fibroblast, uh, the, the vascular growth factor, the incompetent uh, vasculature. This is where minimal injury artery embolization happens. It blocks that step here. So by blocking that step, we're stuck here. There's no further growth. And then either the physiologic uh, processes take place and there's the reabsorption of the subdural hematoma, or then the surgical drainage happens. Um, it, it, looking back a little bit in the in, in, in PubMed, you, you see that um, there the first report of middle meningeal artery embolization for uh, subdural hematoma happened in 2003. It was in Japan, about four and four patients. These patients had multiple recurrent surgical treatments, so finally somebody did that and, and had good results, but it never really took off until about 2018 when there was a report from Korea with about uh, 60 patients who had un MMA embolization and there were zero recurrences in that paper. That led to a, a significant increase in interest and publications. You can see it's following, and I, I don't think we've seen the peak yet of that of that uh, of that chart. Um, currently, in the U.S., there are about 19 studies 
uh, ongoing trials ongoing for middle meningeal artery embolization. I'll save you the the the, the specific data, but overall, if you, this is a meta analysis of of the of the retrospective or the prospectively uh, uh, held data, um, observational data uh, from middle meningeal artery embolization. Uh, we know that the recurrence is significantly less. The recurrence is about four, you know, four point four percent recurrence rate, um, compared to again five to thirty percent in the in the surgical field and the surgical arm. Uh, the surgical retreatment is also the need for retreatment is significantly less, and the risk of complication and hospital complication is similar. So there's it's not a it's a safe procedure. We know it's safe. We know it works, and and we know it helps. Um, there are three randomized controlled trials currently uh, ongoing in the U.S. Uh, they're pretty much all the same. They're addressing chronic uh, or subacute subdural hematomas. Um, the treatment uh, arms are similar. Uh, one is conventional management, whatever that is, surgery or non-surgical, and uh, the versus conventional management plus the middle meningeal artery embolization as as an added. Um, the interesting part is all uh, all three trials the, the, are they're using liquid embolics. We'll talk about later a little bit later, but there are different ways uh, of treating the, this uh, disease. But all the the current trials are using the the liquid embolics. And Onyx is the one that we use the most, but there's also Squid and NBCA is an older uh, uh, older liquid embolic as well. So uh, the all uh, two of these trials, Embolize and STEM, uh, gave their interim analysis, uh, interim results at the International Stroke Conference in February of this year, and they were very, very uh, positive and encouraging. So for Embolize, which had 600 patients, the, the primary endpoint was rate of hematoma recurrence or progression that required surgical drainage within 90 days of treatment. This was 4.1% in the, the embolization group and 11.3% in the surgery alone group, which again, it's a relative risk of 0 0.36, it's statistically significant. The numbers needed to treat was 14. Uh, uh, so remember you have 14, you need to treat 14 patients to get benefit with the middle major artery embolization. Uh, this is, uh, compare that to the 60,000 new patient a year. So that is definitely very significant. Also, there's no difference in, in it was, you know, the embolization was not inferior in terms of uh, neurologic deterioration. Uh, there is low serious adverse events. There was no difference in death and there was no uh, onyx uh, related uh, uh, issues. The STEM was was a little bit, it was kind of similar results. It had, the, the primary endpoint was a bit more broad. So it was residual hematoma or reaccumulation at, uh, for at 180 days, so a longer follow-up, uh, reoperation as well and any new major stroke, MI, or death. Uh, the failure rate in standard management alone was 40%, 40 percent, four zero, 40 percent. And the embolization group was 15 percent. These numbers seem a bit high, but you have to think, remember the primary endpoint was very broad. It's not just reaccumulation, it was subdural. This is also added any, any MI, a stroke, any any death, uh, you know, anything, any, anything that uh, can be related to it. So, um, and it's a longer follow-up. And also the difference was greater in the uh, non-surgical cord than in the surgical cord. Now there was the, 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 the uh, all-cause death was, was, was similar in, in both arms. So again, very positive, very, very um, uh, promising result. Magic MT is an, another randomized trial. Uh, this was also the, the 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 results were presented in the International Stroke Conference in February. This is a, a study that comes from China. They included 722 patients. Um, they in in this uh, it's a little bit different. They did uh, um, these patients were you know treated with with the uh, Burhol or conservative management, and within each group they 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 randomized participants to go with onyx or no onyx embolization. The primary endpoint, same thing, symptomatic recurrence or progression of the subdural hematoma or death within 90 days. Again, it was significantly decreased with the middle meningeal artery embolization at 7.2% versus 12.2% with a very significant peak. In their sub-analysis, they noticed that, the interesting, it's a little bit different than the previous study, than the STEM, the greatest benefit was with, with, with patients who were treated conservatively, not with those who treated with burholes. It's not really understood why we don't, you don't have enough data to kind of uh, understand it, but that's the, what, what it showed. Um, the greatest benefit also in patients with known head trauma, that could potentially be to the fact that because the patients who did not have head trauma had the higher likelihood of having, of being on antithrombotic medication, um, patients who had a greater midline, sh uh, midline shift, less than 10 millimeter, also did, fared better. That kind of makes sense. And smaller hematoma volume. Um, 
and uh, in addition also the imposition was was associated with a lower rate of serious adverse event at, at 90 days as well so all that is is we have all very positive outcomes very very uh, clearly clearly very positive uh, results um, these are essentially the, the, the part of the studies that are ongoing right now in the United States. Uh, we're not going to go over them, obviously. But uh, so essentially, we, we know that subdural hematoma um, embolization, the MMA embolization for subdural hematoma works. So the data is clear. We, we, there is every, the, the retrospective study has showed it. The prospective study has shown it. The randomized control trial, the interim analysis showed it. It is, it, it is very clear. Now, the question becomes then, when? Or who? So when do we do it? When do we offer it? Who uh, tends to 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 benefit from it? I wanted to show these two imaging for images first to show exactly who would not benefit uh, uh, from, from this from this procedure. Who should not be on that list of of uh, MMA embolization? At least not alone, not a standalone. Uh, on the left, you see a chronic subdural hematoma. Uh, with about three centimeter, 3.5 centimeter of, of uh, uh, thickness with significant uh, mass effect. This is not somebody that you can treat with standalone subdural uh, uh, MMA embolization. This subdural hematoma has sig uh, clearly a significant mass effect. This needs to be uh, evacuated with a burr hole. And then if you need to, we can do the MMA embolization, but this is not an ideal candidate for a standalone. On the left, you can see an acute a traumatic subdural hematoma with midline shift as well. This is not somebody you sit on. This is, you know, middle meningeal artery embolization. Remember, the way the way it works is it by breaking the vicious cycle and allows the the physiologic process to take place to allow for resorption of the blood. By by by, uh, when somebody has this acute subdural hematoma, that's not somebody you can sit on and wait for the resorption. This is this is a, a, in most cases a, a surgical emergency with with that would need a craniotomy for or craniectomy for evacuation. So the main main indications there are threefold. One is the most common one that we that we've seen and that we've used so far is an adjuvant treatment or adjunct treatment after surgical evacuation. So you evacuate. You're worried about about somebody who's they're going to recur. Uh, they're old. They have a trophic brain. They're on a coagulation. So you do the MMA embolization, or you see a lot of membranes. You're not able to dissect the membranes. So that's what it is. Second is somebody who has a, a hem subdural hematoma, they undergo surgery, they come back later with a recurrence, and that's uh, uh, you do an MMA embolization. And third, which is now being more and more explored, is an initial treatment, is a standalone treatment for, for these patients. And, and we'll talk a little bit about it. But that's, that definitely, as, as we can see, this, it is safe. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and it is it works very well. So a standalone treatment is definitely something that is uh, uh, appropriate for, for select patients. First thing first is you, this procedure sounds um, easy, sounds uh, benign. You know, you're doing uh, an ex uh, the, the middle meningeal artery uh, is a branch of the external carotid circulation. You're not going into the intracranial circulation. So it's a low risk. You know, we're not manipulating anything intracranial. Um, However, uh, you need to understand the anatomy very well of the middle majority. In, in particular, there are very uh, there are multiple uh, significant collaterals or connections between um, anastomosis between the extracranial circulation and intracranial circulation through the middle meningeal artery. The most common is a communication between the MMA and the ophthalmic artery through the lacrimal artery. As you can see in this angio, is actually in this angio, the middle meningeal artery actually is arises from the ophthalmic artery. So clearly, this is not a a, a safe uh, embolization. You're not going to go into because you know the risk here is blindness. So that's not something you would want to proceed with. Um, interestingly enough, there's a. It was just um, I saw this one paper from from Germany. It's it's only in one paper in in 42 patients. However. They looked at their middle meningeal artery embolization for subdural hematoma population. They noted that there is 13.8 percent, so eight out of you know uh, uh, eight eight, uh, eight patients or eight sides because they did multiple sides in some patients. Uh, the there was a direct uh, uh, communication between the ophthalmic artery or and the middle meningeal artery uh, compared to 0 0.7 percent um, from from the general population. So. Um, essentially the numbers are eight out of 58 and one out of 131. So we don't understand why, um, but 
this is this is uh, it's an interesting uh, thing to, to to keep in mind and to make sure that um, when you're doing these MMA embolization, the first thing you need to do is to look at the internal circulation to make sure that the ophthalmic artery arises from the internal carotid, uh, to make sure you see the retinal blush, to make sure that there's no clear communication between the middle meningeal artery and the ophthalmic artery. This is another thing to to look into. So. Uh, when we're when you're uh, uh, when you're looking at the anatomy of the middle medial artery, uh, the, one of the branches is uh, one of the first branches is the petrosal petrosquamosal branch, which is this one here that goes all the way back to and and supplies the um, uh, some uh, cranial nerves. Most importantly, the cranial nerve seven nucleus. So it is important to 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 be aware of that because. Typically, we'll talk a little bit later about what agents we're using, but if you use something like glue, if you glue that artery, that, that's not necessarily a big problem because uh, there are a lot of collaterals that will supply the the um, uh, the cranial nerve uh, nuclei. However, if you use something like, like embosphere, something like particles that, 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 uh, that go into the distal capillary uh, branches, um, these, if they go into the capillaries that supply the the the, the nuclei, there's no there's no collaterals that can help you there. This is actually a, a, a case with, which was treated with onyx, and the onyx cast did go into the squamosal branch here, in the uh, in the petro, petro squamosal branch. Uh, it, it the patient woke up with a facial nerve palsy, but it was temporary, and then and then she regained. This is uh, another uh, exam uh, example. This is the middle major artery coming normally out of the external uh, uh, of the uh, IMAX, uh, but you can see clearly here through the lacrimal uh, lacrimal artery and it goes to the ophthalmic artery. So embolizing this will lead to the occlusion of the of the central retinal artery and lead to permanent uh, uh, blindness in that eye. This is another example. This is somebody, uh, a patient came in with subdural. It's an older gentleman, had a fall a while back, non-recognized, essentially came, came, comes in. We do the, the the external carotid run. Everything looks good. We go in with the microcatheter. We do an internal, a, 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 a selective run, and we see a, actually a fistulization. This, all these vessels, these are veins. So you can see them on the AP and on the lateral. So there's a fistulization there. And the last thing you want is uh, embolic uh, material to, to go into that, that vein because it's a very fast flow. So it goes, it will go into the veins first and then it can go back to the heart and, and into the general circulation. So that's not something that you, you want to, uh, you want to embolize, uh, at least not with particles. Um, we pulled the microcatheter out, did a run from the from the from the from the uh, external carotid. Same thing. You don't see anything. You go in to do the selective run. You see it. So sometimes the connection is so small that you don't see it on the the overall the the big uh, uh, injections. You have to do selective injections to make sure. And that's why you always have to do selective injections to, before embolizing to make sure you're safe. To make sure you're not missing anything. You're not missing any small anastomosis that you're not seeing uh, because the, there's big flow some going somewhere else. So, so the when, when do we do it? Is there an optimal timing for doing these middle major artery embolization? Uh, we don't know, the short answer is we don't know for sure yet. Now, what, what, what we do know is this is, this is, uh, this is a study um, uh, looking at essentially a, a, a nationwide uh, uh, database. They had 606 uh, patients, 150, 156 uh, uh, hospitals or, or clinics or institutes. And what they noticed is uh, for patients who underwent both uh, uh, MMA embolization and surgery during the same hospitalization during the same stay, ended up having higher direct cost, higher complication rate, and longer length of stay. They had lower readmission rates, uh, uh, which was expected as well. So the answer is not clear here, but there might be a benefit for, you know, unless, doing, unless you're doing a standalone MMA embolization, it might be a benefit of doing a, you know, do the do the surgery, evacuate whatever you need to do, let the patient go home, recover, and then reschedule the the MMA embolization at a at an elective time. You know, but through after a follow up CT scan, if need be, scheduled as an elective time. Uh, these patients typically uh, after the embolization, they leave the, the next morning. Sometimes they can leave the same day. We like to keep them until the next morning to observe them after every embolization. Um, but but um, so that might be the more accepted way or or less risky way at least as of we as of the data right now 
the one of the main questions we always get as well is when when do we restart the aspirin when do we restart the eloquist this patient was on coumadin has a mechanical valve this patient has pe when do we when can we restart the heparin or the lovenox or what, whatever it might be the eloquist um again we don't have clear answers yet however <clears throat> based on the data that we know right now, one of the main independent factors of failure of the middle mid artery embolization or of recurrence is use of a factor 10A inhibitor, so the DOAX. Now, interestingly, uh, in that paper where they did a nationwide analysis similar to you know the previous one where they looked at, at, uh, at uh, 322 patients, the, the, the recurrence was higher significantly higher with, with patients who are on uh, taking the factor 10, 10 a inhibitors. However, the retreatment was similar. It wasn't higher. So we, the, these patients are re-bleeding, or maybe they're recurring, maybe there's some hyperacuity within that blood without significant increase in the volume, without need for, for rescue maneuvers. So that's also, again, we, we still don't know for sure. Um, we what what uh, uh, so that's one of the things that we have to keep looking into. So, as with every new technique, new try, new new technology, uh, we have very limited indications to start with. Where we you know we're still um, nervous. We want to do it to very specific patients, um, and then slowly we'll start expanding our our indications. And this is one one such paper they looked into. Uh, 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 radiographically trial uh, excluded patients. And these are patients who had a uh, more than 50 millimeters in thickness of their subdural hematoma and more than five millimeters in midline shift. And the, the results were that these patients did just as well as the ones that are that were included in the trial. So same thing, decrease in rate of recurrence, decrease in rate of need for rescue, no increase in, in complications. So again, it, we just need to get a bit more comfortable with this, with this, with this, uh, with this new technique within within limits. Again, somebody who has 10 millimeters of midline shift, somebody who's an acute subdural, this is not somebody you, you wanna you wanna uh, you wanna try this this on. Final the final uh, section is how. So we know we know we know it works, we know when to do it. The question is how do we do it? Um first first thing first we have to know the anatomy of the middle major artery. You have to know the, the the anastomosis. You have to know what you're looking for. You have to know that what you're what you're avoiding, what you're trying to avoid. Uh, uh, this <clears throat> well, also what you want to see is I don't know if you can tell here on the first picture. Here, there's a little bit of blush at the end here, and then there's on these two you can see it a lot better. There's a lot of blush at the end of of these small capillaries, and you can see very high vascularity. This is not something you see with every middle meningeal artery uh, 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 angiogram. And this blush is is, is these new neocapillaries. It is this these new membranes. It is these new vessels that are feeding this subdural hematoma. So this is what you want to target. If you see that, you know this is what you want to target. You don't always see it, but if you see it, you know exactly what you need to do. The, we have three embolic types of embolic agents uh, available in the market. You have the liquid embolics. Onyx is the most commonly used in the U.S. right now. Um, there is NBCA, which was which has fell, fell out of favor ever since Onyx came on the market. Um, but still, there's, there's still we can still use it. Uh, the, the particles, most commonly the embospheres, they come in different sizes. Uh, <clears throat> we start with like by forty microns up to five hundred, and <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> 750 microns. Um, for this, uh, for, for MMA embolization, you want to use the smaller ones. You want to use the smallest because, again, the goal is to penetrate those capillaries and not to just block the main trunk. So you want to use the smaller uh, embospheres that you have to go distal. And I'll show some data about that later. Um, and finally, there's the coils, which essentially we use, we've been using for, for, for uh, you know, three decades now uh, and we are very comfortable with. <clears throat> so which agent to use? Um, there are very few trials or studies that, or, or papers that compare one agent to another. What we have is a collection of trials or again, uh, uh, papers, um, that use a specific agent and reported results. And right now, based on what we have, there is not a clear cut winner. Uh, I'm showing here, this is a paper from 2024. On the left, they used only coils. They coiled the, the, the MMA and they had great results. Another trial, uh, they did a, a using a liquid embolic, um, same thing. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis using just liquid embolics. Same thing. 
great results, low complication, low recurrence. Um, this is one uh, one of the rare trials that compared, you know, onyx versus particles. Uh, both are both had great results. Both uh, had very low um, failure rate of embolization. Both ha had very low and similar uh, unplanned rescue surgical evacuation. The only difference is that on uh, late follow-up, the volume of uh, subdural hematoma was significantly lower in the particle um, in the particle group. The question remains, though, is this the agent or is this the technique? Again, we don't know that because um, this this paper the, the, the illustrates that concept very very nicely. What they did is they they had three different groups. One group they did what we call they called aggressive penetration, and by that they meant going distal into those capillaries, into those distal branches of the middle medial artery. The second group they did a non-aggressive penetration, so just they 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 blocked the, the proximal branches, but they also did proximal coiling, so they shut down the trunk of the middle medial artery. And the third group they did just non non-aggressive uh, penetration alone. What the results were is that patients with aggressive penetration, the rate of surgical rescue was the lowest. The, the lo was, it was about 2.6%. Compared to the non-aggressive penetration with proximal coin, it was about 9%. The ones with non-aggressive penetration alone was, was 11%. So it's, it's pretty high. Um, however, both the aggressive penetration and the non-aggressive penetration with, with the proximal coiling had significantly improved hematoma resolution compared to the non-aggressive penetration alone. So it, it kind of makes sense. What you need to do is to shut down those small capillaries. So whether you shut them down with, with, with particles, whether you shut them down with, with onyx or liquid, other liquid embolics, it doesn't matter. As long as you shut down those, those, those deep feeders. Um, that's what is going to give you the most, you know, uh, the most uh, uh, favorable outcomes and and uh, clinical and radiographic results. So, do we know what does not work? When we know what works, what does not work? Uh, the, the, the data is also sparse, but we have some understanding of what works and what what, what doesn't work. One of the main predictors of failures is use of anticoagulation. Again, patients, not necessarily after, but even the patients who are on antithrombotic uh, or antiplatelet agents tend to have a higher uh, uh, risk of failure with MMA embolization. We don't know exactly why. Is it because we're restarting them soon? We, there's not, not clear data on that. Uh, the diameter of the middle meningeal artery if it's under two millimeter, that leads to, uh, that's a high risk of failure. And that is twofold. One is when the diameter is two under two millimeter, you can imagine it's a lot harder to embolize and a lot harder to 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 to, to uh, get access to. And we see that a lot in, in older, you know, 85, 90 year olds, um, your your the 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 vessels become very tortuous, very calcified, and and it, with very sharp angles. Even the the best microcatheters that we have on the market right now cannot make those turns. So you, you can imagine it, it, if it's a, the the smaller the vessel, the harder to to embolize safely, and the harder uh, to to even just access. The other thought is, if you have a middle major artery that is under two millimeter in size, or I'll put it this way: if you have one that is over two millimeter in size. You, it is more likely that this is uh, this vessel has actually matured and is the the blood flow to the to the subdural. It is the demand by the neovascularization that it required that the vessel uh, hypertrophies a little bit and becomes a bit bigger. Versus if it's smaller, it is it is not. I'm not saying it's not possible, but it's less likely that it is the source of the blood to the, the to those membranes. So that's also one of the thought processes behind it. Um, interestingly, one of also the 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 failure of uh, predictors of failure is the non occlusion of the main trunk. So we talked about aggressive penetration, but by aggressive penetration, if you penetrate distally, it's important also to to block the trunk. Whether you you do with liquid embolics and 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 onyx, or whether you use particles and then close the proximal trunk with with uh, coils, it doesn't matter. Whatever 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 you're more comfortable with, both work very well. Um, 
but it, it, it seems that one of the main important things to, for us to do is, it, it, the question is, is it because now if you're not closing the main trunk, they're finding different routes to revascularize versus if you close the main trunk, you're shutting down the entire the entire vascular tree and then and that gives you better outcomes. We're not certain, but that's, that's where the most accepted theory is. Midline shift is a question mark because you know if you have a two millimeter midline shift, it's not like you're having ten millimeter midline shift. But it is it's it's been reported as possible a, a higher midline shift is a, a, a predictors of failure. And I'll argue a, a higher midline shift should not be should not go as a standalone middle artery embolization. Uh, in terms of anesthetic, what are we? I'm not gonna go too much into details. Essentially, both general anesthesia and non-general anesthesia both have similar results, similar complication rate, similar length of stay, similar everything. So uh, everything uh, with uh, everything being equal, um, general anesthesia might have the benefit of keeping the patient more comfortable. Of uh, of you know these again, like I said, these are two millimeter vessels, so it's less 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 motion, but cleaner pictures, less risk of 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 uh, you know not being able to 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 get where you need to do. But again, everybody everybody has their own uh, cocktail that works for them. For us, we typically intend using general anesthesia because the patient does does better and. Uh, we specifically if you're using liquid embolic, sometimes injecting the MSO or the other liquid embolic can uh, quote unquote burn or meaning give that feeling. So the patient can tend to be very specifically in, in the um, in the dura, which is painful, which senses pain. Um, it, it might be it, it it might be beneficial to put them under general just to avoid the patient being that uncomfortable. So I'm going to go through just a couple of case examples to, to so we can understand exactly what we what we do and how we think about this thing. This is the first case. This is a 70 year old uh, had comes in with this large subdural hematoma, uh, chronic small acuity, but some chronic. She underwent a burr holes uh, evacuation. You can see there's quite a bit midline shift. It's thick subdural. This is not somebody we would think to do a standalone MMA or or initial MMA within watching her. Um, uh, she uh, this was the initial post up scan. Uh, and then after you can see that it recurred about three weeks later, we're talking about essentially pretty much it's the same, but it, it, just less volume. And it looks like it can, it has a potential to, to continue to grow. If you look at that CT, it's actually impressive because you can kind of see it's almost a completely different um, uh, uh, compartment. You can see the, the, the salsa and the brain are still there. And you can see it's almost like something, somebody put something on top. It's like a cap on top of the brain. So she underwent a middle major embolization. This is the, pre the micro micro run from the with the catheter. You can see all the the vessels here. This is a micro run post embolosphere. You don't see anything anymore. And this is the external run after the after the embolization, and you don't see that that artery anymore at all. It comes back twelve weeks post embolization. This is the result. So a great result. There's still some very minor blood, but that that essentially that's that will continue to to resolve. This is another case. This is a 70 year old female comes in very minor head trauma, uh, unrecognized. Uh, you know, about a month prior to presentation, she had, uh, but she presented essentially with gradual cognitive decline. She's less interactive. She's falling. She's off balance. So the CT scan shows again that subdural again same if you that same look of of almost separated from the brain. This is the initial injection. You can see the injection actually goes bilateral, which which is not very uncommon. We see that. Um, this is the onyx cast, and this is about four months after embolization alone that everything is, is has resolved. One thing I'd say uh, we have noticed there are some some uh, uh, some cases where you do one side you don't see you don't see a minimal injury artery you go on the other side, and you see that there, it's a big minimal injury artery that supplies both sides of the brain. So to keep that in mind, if you want to embolize one side, you inject, you don't see anything, go look at the other side and make sure that there's no contralateral flow into from the minimal injury artery. This is a this is a third case. This is somebody, uh, this is also a 74-year-old female, comes in, uh, very bad headaches. Uh, uh, she had a fall about a you know a few weeks prior, doesn't remember much. It wasn't that big of a deal. Um, and she had a CT scan. You can see uh, on the left side, there's a subdural hematoma, uh, acute, some acute, mostly chronic, but you can also see it's almost septated. It's not one, uh, one, 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 one uh, it's not one compartment. You can see almost like two big areas that are uh, contiguous. So with this patient, we decided to do two things because of her headaches were so bad, we decided to do a, a evacuation with a SEPS procedure. 
which is essentially just uh, a small bedside procedure where we just put a small hole in the bone and, and screw in a, a drain that drains it out and irrigate it. And then we did also the middle meningeal artery embolization. I want you to see well, the important thing about this one is first is you can see how robust that middle meningeal artery is, how thick it is. And you can see this is the uh, petrosal petrosal muscle branch. So this is a branch we want to avoid uh, sending particles in. And you can see here, this branch anteriorly here goes over the orbit. Now, we don't see clear communication with the ophthalmic artery. However, when you have such good flow somewhere, uh, anywhere, everywhere else, a small communication, you're not going to be able to see it unless you go into that artery and, and inject to confirm. So in the absence of that, because obviously this is a very small artery, a lot of tortuosity, the goal would be to avoid any branches that look like they go over the orbit because that's, that, that's where you can get, run into trouble. So... We advanced the microcatheter distally into that main, you know, trunk that that looked like it. It uh, you can see it. It uh, it gave a, a flow to to that. It gave uh, um, the perfusion to that clot, and you can see all these small branches at the end of it. It's it's these small tentacles. So you can clearly tell that this is something that is supplying something there. So this is after the uh, the particle embolization. You can see there's still a stump here. That's the main trunk of the middle meningeal artery. The squamosal branch and the frontal are preserved. We put some coils in it, and now it's completely shut down. This is how we started. This is our this was our target here. This is where we end. We still the squamosal branch is still is still pain. And the frontal branch are still is still pain right here. So this was initial. This is post up day one. You see the errors because also we did the 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 uh, steps and this is three weeks out, complete resolution, uh, normal normal CT scan. And this is a, a last case. This is a uh, sixty eight year old gentleman uh, has been on long term uh, anticoagulation. It was uh, one of the DOACs because of uh, recurrent PEs, so he was placed on lifelong uh, DOAC. He also had a procedure scheduled for another uh, you know uh, for a urologic procedure. He comes in with just a little bit of confusion, nothing crazy. Um, uh, we got a CT scan. You have this this sub chronic subdural, whole hemispheric subdural. There's not a midline shift. The patient is doing fine. Concerned for some seizure. Got some anti seizure medication. This is somebody that you know. It's not. It's it's a. It's not that thick of a subdural. We decided to try the standalone uh, MMA embolization. This is the initial run. You can see the middle meningeal artery again. You can see all these small vessels at the end. You can tell kind of like they're almost penetrating that 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 uh, fluid this is after we used em, 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 um, embosphere the embolic uh, particles and coil you can see the coil mass here we shut down the main trunk so you only see now the sta you don't see anything else this was three weeks post embolization you know significant recurrent significant decrease you can see the, the, there is this is the volume initially this is the now the volume there's significant decrease in the volume so we're happy with that because he was very high risk for <clears throat> PEs, he was restarted on anti, on his on his eloquist. He comes back about six weeks out. The volume is still going in the right direction. It's a very significant decrease. However, you can see some acute blood here in the front. And that, that goes back to the idea of there is a higher risk of recurrence, but similar risk of re, re, uh, re-intervention. So this is a good example of that. When we saw that, we, we stopped his anticoagulation again and said, okay, you have to, we have to stop until there's complete resolution. Uh, comes back three months later, and and uh, this is his head CT, which is complete complete resolution of, of, of the subdural. Now, I showed you these cases. Now, obviously, there are certain cases just short of time. There are certain cases where either you can't do the middle meningeal artery, you can't, you can't access it, or uh, like I showed you earlier, the one that has a fistula. You, 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 so there are still certain cases where we can't, necessarily embolize, but the vast majority of cases are successful. We have a very good, we have very good results and very low recurrence. Again, in a disease that is going to be the number one neurosurgical disease by 2030, this is, I think, a very promising, very, um, uh, very helpful uh, new technique. So in, in conclusion, essentially, we, we, the why, when and who, why is because we need it, because we don't have good treatment for chronic subdural hematomas that are, that are going to uh, become the number one disease, uh, neurosurgical disease in 2030 with high morbidity, high mortality. Um, the when is we don't necessarily exactly know right now, but the best idea is either a standalone by itself or in a delayed fashion post uh, evacuation. Uh, again, the limited data that we have is if you have both, uh, uh, if you do them both together, there's a bit higher risk of complication and, and longer hospital stays. 
Um, and uh, the how is whatever works for you, whatever works for the for the neurosurgeon who's doing it or the interventional who's doing it, as long as you have good penetration, uh, the aggressive penetration, as long as you close out the the proximal trunk. And with that, I'll I'll, I'll see if you have uh, questions here. Uh, with Dr. Kelly, and uh, it's a very, very good question. I'll read it. It's a uh, uh, frequently imaging of elderly patients demonstrates subdural hygromas when assessing a symptomatic patient. How do you best distinguish between chronic subdural versus benign hygroma? So uh, the 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 main thing is there are some certain characteristics that can help. You know, if it's if it's a similar uh, intensity uh, or density to the CSF, it's most likely hygroma. If it's if it's uh, symmetric, identical on both sides with, you don't see any, uh, the gyra are uh, preserved, there's no mass effect, there's no local even mass effect. Um, as you can, you, you saw some of the pictures that I showed earlier, you can almost see that there's a, almost like a cap on top of the brain, uh, which is the chronic subdural, subacute subdurals. When you don't see that, it's more likely to be a hygroma. Um, if it's symptomatic, hygromas typically are not as uh, hygromas uh, are not typically symptomatic. So if we are, if we if somebody's symptomatic with a subdural collection, we tend more to be uh, uh, think that this might be a a, a subdural. Now, obviously, uh, symptoms could be from something else, but if 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 we think uh, symptoms are coming from that collection, it's typically more likely to be a uh, a, a subdural. All right. So. Um, with that, I think that was the only question. Um, with that, we conclude our first our first session. Uh, thank you all for for joining us today. Um, we uh, will we'll watch out for the for the for the emails. I think uh, we have the uh, e the eats codes for uh, that was posted in the chat for everybody who who wants CMEs. Uh, please make sure to get that. Um, and um, I will see you in 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 a couple of weeks. Uh, please watch out for those emails. And have a good morning, everyone.